Live from the Duncan Latte Lounge. Welcome to the Duncan Latte Lounge. Of course, my name is Garrett from Elvis Duran and the morning show with me, a guy that you should already know. And if you don't, well, this is why we're here today, too. We welcome Chaz Cardigan to the Duncan Latte Lounge. Chaz, how are you, sir? Hey, hey, man. I'm so good, Garrett. Thank you for having me. Oh, please. I mean, the doors are always open at, Dun- at the Duncan Latte Lounge. We, you know, we I, not to say we let anybody in, but we we let artists that have a cool story. And uh, the whole point of this, obviously, is to to introduce people to new music that they might not be aware of already. But I mean, l- I, l- before we even get started of the accomplishments, let's start from the beginning. Grew up in Kentucky. Your parents had nothing to do with music, so right off the bat where did your love for music come from i was just always on around the house um my parents i I think they both maybe had some vicarious dreams of being around music but you know there wasn't a lot to do in kentucky in the 70s and 80s when they were growing up so they would just go to shows right and so a lot of the music that i was surrounded by as a kid was their record collection and all the bands that they'd gone to see and i think there was always like a fascination there for them just with no sort of entry point but my sister uh was 10 years older than me is 10 years older than me (laughs) that didn't (laughs) change over time um but she she played piano when i was growing up and you know when you're a kid you just want to be like your older siblings so bad i really absorbed her cd collection which in the late 90s this would have been backstreet boys in sync britney spears christina aguilera the very like max martin big bubblegum 90s pop music and I loved that stuff. I thought that's what music was. And so I picked right. up piano to learn how to pull that off. I always, you know, I like making things. I was always making little inventions out of shoestring and scotch tape. And suddenly I found piano and guitar and it was just this new thing to make. It was this new way to show off something. I don't know. You know, kids just want to be seen and music was this ultimate way to be seen. So, so from that too, so after, you know, absorbing what, you know, your parents were listening to and shows that they were going to and your sister's musical taste too, like, where did you go? You know what? I'm going to pick up, you know, an actual guitar, nothing that I made homemade uh, and, and, and start and, and start something that I have this natural ability with and, and to, and, and accomplish it and turn this into a, a, a day job, a full-time job for myself. Oh gosh. Um, you know, it's wild. I don't know where the switch happened for me. Music was just always what I saw myself doing. I mean, I had right. had You didn't other... want to be like a veterinarian growing up? No, no. I mean, I think I, I had definitely other creative ambitions, but my goal was always make things. Right. Okay. And whatever that looked like, that's what I would do. And the shape that that took for me as a kid was guitar and piano and playing in punk bands. And then I'm writing my own songs and... I'm playing in these bar shows when I'm like a a middle schooler and enough adults around are like, hey, you need to go to Nashville. But we just started making these daily treks down to Nashville. And my parents were really great about this. Like like you said in the intro, we didn't know anybody. It's not like we were like connected. We didn't really have money to just sink into music. Right. Um, So my dad would drive me to Nashville pretty much every day and was always encouraging me, you know, you can do whatever you want. If you want to do music, I'm going to emotionally support you, but you have to figure out how this makes money. And I just figured that out over the course of high school. And by the time it was, you know, the moment we force on 18 year olds where you're supposed to decide what do you do with your life? The pivotal fork in the road. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it made sense. I had a mentor that was like, hey, you know, you could sink yourself into debt and go to college or you're already making money doing music. Why not just keep doing this? So I moved to Nashville. So you hear a lot of artists, too. I mean, the uh, artist, I mean, literally, you could, you know, turn turn any which way and run into an artist. What is it about Nashville? If you could, like, kind of sum it up for those that they always hear, like, oh, yeah, we moved to Nashville or I live in Nashville. I, you know, I go down and I write in Nashville. What is it you think personally, Chaz, uh, about Nashville that that is that thing for artists like yourself and many others? Sure. Um, I don't live here anymore, actually. I'm here right now for, for tour rehearsal. But Nashville is a writer's town. And what I mean by that is, the economic bedrock of Nashville quite literally is songwriting. 
right. from the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, uh, countries, you know, big mainstream rebirth in the 90s, and then record labels moving here throughout the course of the 2010s and now in the early 2020s. And it's a town where you really have to respect and be good at the craft of songwriting as a trade. And what that means is you're waking up every day, coming into a session, writing a song every single day. And that's what living here is. And so to survive in the town requires you um, respecting songwriting as a, as a trade. And I, I think it forces you to just appreciate every form of music. It, it teaches you right. that all music is valid all creativity is valid and we're here to work. I mean, you know, as you've seen of working with so many people that live there, come there, you're like you said, you're there to, to rehearse for tour. I mean, right. someone like Ed Sheeran who could live anywhere in the world has a, a place in Nashville just to go to show you like what type of people come, everyone and anyone comes to Nashville, which I find super interesting. So I appreciate you sharing that with us too. So, all right, let's talk about, you know, where people might have heard your music before already, or, or they're finally putting a face to the name or they're like, I have heard that song, but where, let's talk about Netflix. All right. So how, how, that. give me the backstory for, uh, as a, as a, El, sorry, as I'll ever be, it's a mouthful at first. Um, <laughs> how did it get featured on to all the boys? Uh, P.S. I, I still love you. Like, is that something you seek out? Is it something that you just write and with no intention of like, oh, I could see this being a part of a movie or a show. You just someone comes to you. Like, how does that process work? Um, so I had been writing for some time for uh, for an EP that eventually came out on the label I was on at the time. And As I'll Ever Be was on different iterations of that EP and then it just didn't work and we loved it, but it didn't really fit and we didn't have a home for it. And that record label was curating the soundtrack to to all the boys, P.S. I Still Love You. Right. And we had submitted like six or seven songs for the film and none of them got placed and so, you know, you get used to hearing no a lot. Right. I was very, I was resigned. This is okay. That's fine. And as I'll ever be was nowhere in the list of what we submitted. It, it wasn't in the brief. It wasn't relevant to any of the prompts that they needed for the film. But legitimately what happened was the soundtrack supervisor, uh, her name is Lindsay Wolfington. She's amazing, was walking through the hallway of my record label at the time and heard my rep listening to the demo of As I'll Ever Be and said, hey, can we use that for the slow dance scene? <laughs> and they used it as uh, as just a temporary, like a placeholder as they were editing the scene. And then they said, hey, actually, this is really great. We would really love to use this. And it ended up being this, um, a pivotal moment but like like near the climax of the movie yeah i mean it's a pretty pivotal moment but it just goes to show you like you could work your tail off you know of plotting and planning and yep. then all of a sudden just doing nothing that you in intended on doing and all of a sudden it, it is true what they say you know right place right time you know for the most yep. part it, you know and people want that secret sauce but it really isn't something you can explain to people it's just you have to be right. in the moment Right, right, right. The secret is that I, I worked for over a decade and played hundreds of shows to, right. <laughs> to land a record deal. And then it just so happened that the right person walked through the hallway and was like, hey, can we use that in the movie? That's really what that's really all it is. Well, well it is. I mean, but but eventually if it didn't happen there. It happened somewhere else, because, again, you also put in the work. It's not like you were getting into the studio for the first time ever. And then all of a sudden like that, like everybody sees on a TV show and then thinks, oh, that's how I can become, you know, an artist or get signed, you know, go on a The Voice or American Idol. And then all of a sudden, you know, right. there, there's that backstory that not a lot of people understand. And uh, no, I, I, another, you know, thank you for opening up and, and explaining that, too. So uh, let's talk about your music uh, you, you know so you, you said you, you you were influenced by your sister and your parents but who influenced you now in music um that that you are a fan of that you know the elevator pitch of someone like hey who are you listening to who are you liking who are you vibing with what can i like let's get into your your playlist Chaz. oh my gosh my playlist well like everybody it switches every week if not every month <laughs> 
Um, everybody's always telling you, oh, listen to this, listen to this, listen to this. So my sort of routine for sorting through that is I throw it all in one big playlist and switch it out every month. Um, I am obsessed, like a lot of people, with Phoebe Bridgers. I think she is the best songwriter we've got right now. Oh, wow. That's, that's under 30. I, I mean, she is so incredible. And I think she's changing the shape of what music can be. And that's a big I, statement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I really, which like on some level, look, yes, it's it's a person with a guitar doing songwriter music. But I, I just think the songs are so gutting. They're fantastic. I love Phoebe Bridgers. Um, huge fan of the 1975. I'm really enjoying this band Middle Kids that I've just found recently. Uh, they're from like, the how do you find music? Are you online? Like, cause that's, the, that's another interesting thing, how people come across music, you know, uh, just like, it, it's interesting 10 years ago when you were like, oh, I found some song on social media, you, you would be like, what the, what the, what, you know, but for you, like, how do you come about music? Where, where, where are you finding music yourself? Yeah. I mean, a lot of it is word of mouth. I, I think you can't overestimate or underestimate how important it is for a friend to tell you, Hey, you should hear this, this, uh, this record. But I'm also a victim of the algorithm, and a lot of my music is is what Spotify says. Hey, you might like this, and it's on my on my dashboard when I log in. It's like, hey, new releases in alternative you might like. Turns out, a lot of the time, it's it's correct. I'm loving this band, uh, the Weather Station, um, and then uh, my, obligatory plug. My best friend uh, is an artist. No, by all means. Yeah, yeah. My best friend is an artist named Jake Wesley Rogers, who is just absolutely like crushing it right now and is having a moment on like doing like his first late night shows right now and is about to go on tour with Ben Platt in the spring. And Jake is just like such a beautiful soul and deserves to be like a generational superstar. Well, and knowing in New York, I think Ben Platt's doing Radio City Music Hall, and so yep. uh, that that's uh, <laughs> congratulations right there. It, yep. it, it's funny how science and technology come into play with you know our emotions. You know, at the end of the day, with music, because you know a song can definitely hit us, but for a computer to say, you know what, I think you'll like this, and like, who are you to tell me what? But sure enough, nine times out of ten, right, right, it, it comes about. So it, it as freaks we me out. Yeah, exactly. So as we sit in the Dunkin' Latte Lounge now, uh, there's one question that, you know, it's, it's kind of like existential, deep thought. You look into yourself a little bit, too. So if we were to, you know, maybe sip some lattes or uh, maybe you just walk into a Dunkin' and get a latte, but you could do it with any artist or performer, actor, actress, family member in your life, in your head, who would that be and why would you pick their brain? Wow. Wow, that's a good question. That's a great question. Um, There's no wrong I, answer to that's the other thing. <laughs> no, I mean, I have two, but my gut response was Sufjan Stevens. And how come? I feel like he is so interesting. I and, and, and the crazy thing is I've listened to every one of his records and I feel like I know him so intimately, but I know nothing about him. He's really, he's got this really cool ability to write gutting like visceral music that doesn't give me any real details about his personal life but somehow tells me everything i need to know and i i, I really admire that and i think it'd just be so fun to get to know someone on a deeper level because of that that's a great sign of a storyteller too where you could tell a story without giving out the entire story you know almost in comparison Taylor Swift does it beautifully too. Where I was gonna say Taylor. Taylor was Taylor was another one that came to mind, which I just so brilliant. Yeah, continue. Yeah, she can she can bring you to that point where you know, as a a, a listener or a reader, if you're reading a story, you're like, give me more. But she knows, uh, not right now. Look over here. Here's track number two, where there's another story I got to tell you. So, all right. So that's our existential question of the day from uh, <laughs> the Dunkin' Latte Lounge. All right. right. So, Chaz, before uh, we I, I fade to black and and let you take over with a few few songs let's hit up all the social media to follow along if yeah if you're not already where to find you out on tour in a little bit uh so so the stage is yours my friend uh where can everyone follow along if they're they're not already everything is just at chaz cardigan c-h-a-z and then cardigan like you've got in your closet speaking of taylor swift um all right so uh you said you're out on you're in nashville right now prepping for tour so full tour uh coming about the in 
just a couple dates. I'm hitting the road with a band called Cherub that are out of Nashville. Uh, we're just hitting a couple cities in the southeast, and then I'm uh, booking a West Coast tour right now for probably early December, and shooting for a bunch of LA shows right now. We're trying everything we can. COVID, COVID hit us all really, really hard, and so get so creative. We're, yeah, yeah, we're getting creative. You know, it's it's a cool time because everyone in the world wants to play shows at the exact same time, so. The struggle is uh, how do you do that when there are only so many venues in the world? And, and it's interesting, too. I remember speaking with Ryan Tedder at the beginning about a year and a half ago, and he goes, when the time is right, it's just going to be an onslaught of music, live music, music mm -hmm. that artists have been sitting on. Like, it's almost going to be like a different, like almost its own era of music, just with the well, amount of music that's been produced or shows ready to go. So it'd be, it's a fun time to be a part of, and you're, you're right smack in the middle of it. So congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So, so Chaz, I'm going to step back, let you take the stage. I appreciate you hanging out at the Dun Dunkin' Latte Lounge. Uh, for all those watching, hashtag Dunkin' Latte Lounge on social media, DunkinLatteLounge.com to go back, rewatch this interview. It, it doesn't hurt. Watch it two, three, four times. Pass it along or see more interviews just like this right there at DunkinLatteLounge.com. So, Chaz, thank you for everything. I appreciate it. The door is always open here at the lounge uh, for you. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure our friends at Dunkin wouldn't mind just hooking you up, you know, whenever you want. So I, I just wouldn't go like straight there right now because obviously we need to give them a heads up. But you know what I mean? Yes. Thank you so much. <laughs> Chaz, be well. See you soon. And I uh, hope to see you on tour. Yes. Thank you so much, guys. Hello, Duncan Latte Lounge. My name is Chaz Cardigan. We are in my bedroom here in Los Angeles. And I'm gonna start with my song, Haircut. This is all about trying to be a, a better version of yourself today than you were yesterday. Just making these little changes and embracing change and rolling with the punches in life and all that, all, all, the, all the fun platitudes, you know. But uh, it's about starting with the little things and how like, massive, just getting a haircut can feel. I'm dancing, jumping up buildings and breaking my habits just to be different. I got a new hair, switched all my numbers. Sometimes I'm scared of becoming my mother. So I'll
uh, I just put this song out a couple weeks ago. This is the first song from a new project I'm gonna put out, and it's called We Look So Good. It's about being in a relationship that only looks good on paper, but you just wanna stick around. You don't wanna leave, you don't wanna rock the boat too much because, well, that would just be uncomfortable. Uh, <laughs> which is um, toxic. Very unhealthy, my therapist tells me, so. so much work I always have your back you never call me back I guess that we're in love hey baby say what's on your mind you show me yours I'll show you mine we're jumping from a plane and falling into space I guess that we're in love you could leave anytime but I ask you to stay I can leave if I want yeah that's what you say but I don't walk out, I stick around. We look so good together, we look so good together. I mean, if it looks so good on paper, I'm gonna stay until it feels right. We look so good together, we look so good together. I mean, Okay, if you know my music at all, uh, you've probably heard this song. It was on the radio for a little bit of uh, the beginning of the pandemic. It's the only song I've taken to radio so far, and uh, we, we got this to top 15 at Alternative Radio last year. And I think it's just because a lot of people really connected with not feeling the best uh, being stuck in our houses. So I wrote this song about... For me, my panic disorder, and, and uh, I had just years where I would sort of dissociate for months at a time, and, you know, suddenly you wake up, and, and uh, like David Byrne says, well, how did I get here? And it's a song about not wanting to lie about that, so this is called Not Okay.
get stoned, I'm going too fast. And we're rushing, we finally crash. I know a little bit more now than I used to. It'll be the cost I paid. I'm pretty sure I got some. I'll spend a few nights sleeping in my car. Took it too far, the whole time getting kicked out of the bar. Some days, man, I got it all together. see more videos like this, check out DuncanLatteLounge.com. And if you're posting on social, use the hashtag DuncanLatteLounge.